Hello, everyone. Good evening. Uh, tonight, uh, we return um, to the, the art world. I bring you a very special stream on the art and romanticism. I'm very lucky to be joined by uh, Alexander Adams. How are you this evening, um, Alexander? I'm very well, Hitman. Uh, thank you for asking me on. Uh, certainly a pleasure. Uh, yeah, so the sort of the genesis behind this stream, as it were, was um, cause last year you released a book through a uh, publisher, Imperium Press, called and Blood, Soil, Paint, an essay on, you know, sort of art, nationalism and, and sort of romanticism and sort of looking at the relationship between all, all three of them. And um, it was very broad because you sort of start with the romanticist movement proper in the sort of early 19th century and you sort of draw this through line through that, through the course of that century, then in the tw into the 20th through the development of sort of national character and um, particularly with a focus on you know, you look at a lot of like Norwegian um, works, you people like Knut Hampson and um, Edvard Munch can even have a look at the um, sort of the mid-century German's relationship with um, sort of art and romanticism. But for this stream, we're largely going to stick to the earlier content of the book, which is on the romantic period proper, which was from about the sort of late 19th century and then kind of goes to about the mid uh, 19th, 19th century. And so uh, with the sort of main title card here, um, I've got one of the most famous pieces of romantic art, uh, Wanderer Above the Sea of Fog by um, Caspar David Friedrich, um, a German romanticist and sort of one of the most important artists within the movement. And um, obviously many of you are going to recognise this because it does get shared about quite quite a lot. And um, and I just want to address a comment um, Vingle made before we went live, very Faustian. Uh, yes, I would agree with you, Vingle, it is very Faustian. I mean, um, if we're going off this idea of Spengler's idea of Faustian man, then you know, you've got this figure um, who's very boldly climbed up this rock and he's sort of surveying the landscape like he's almost a king surveying his dominions. So what, what do you make of it, Alexander? Uh, yes, this is a favourite uh, image of um, the Rome, of um, people who want to talk about the Romantics and it's like, if you pick up any old copy of uh, Nietzsche published by Penguin, for example, you'll have this on. You'll have this on the cover, and quite right too. I mean, it's uh, it's very appropriate for Nietzsche because, of course, Nietzsche um, uh, used to go um, mountain walking. Um, he, he lived for a lot of time in um, Switzerland, and especially at high altitudes, it was supposed to be um, good for his eyes because he had particularly weak eyes, and so he went um, mountain walking. Um, and uh, you know, sort of, he, he talked about being inspired by climbing mountains and so forth. And, and Zarathustra was sort of, you know, sort of greeting the the rising dawn of the new age, um, you know, sort of uh, on mountain tops and so forth. So this is this is very suitable. So uh, yeah, Caspar David Friedrich is is a seminal figure in Romanticism. I think he's probably, I would say, I would, I mean, I would say he's the best. Um, he's certainly in many respects the most typical because he's sort of <clears throat> he's sort of embracing the um, the sublime qualities of nature of you know sort of beauty and um, one of the qualities of uh, the sublime is um, things that disappear that taper into nothingness so of course uh, of looking into a distance with uh, fog and cloud and it's sort of diminishing into almost imperceptible shades that's um that's typical of the uh the sublime reaction uh, the sublime as uh, defined by burke so uh, yeah this and this is a beautiful image made in sort of you know made at the height of his powers um and so, so yeah, it's a it's a good choice oh thank you and um another motive um that sort of come to my mind is obviously we've got all the mist in the clouds or it makes me think almost of like um, Mount Olympus and the, the Greek pantheon where, you know, the, the, all, all the gods are up there or even perhaps heaven itself. So it's almost like man has ascended to become a god if one's yeah. going to be that, that, um, that ambitious. Yeah, and, and, Nietzsche, and Nietzsche himself was also very interested in the Greeks. I mean, he talked about sort of the Attic uh, tragedy as being the height of culture the height of and sort of something that embodies um deep um spiritual and uh power necessities of man something that's sort of deeply ingrained and so he would look to 
um, not only Attic um, tragedy, but also to um, writers like Heraclitus and Heraclitus's um, uh, sort of very brief telegraphic style of writing in aphorisms was something that um, Nietzsche himself adopted later on and uh, has, has become very influential. But yeah, I, I, I would say, you know, the idea of um, Zeus and the gods in um, on Mount Olympus, it's, um, it's, a, it's a very fitting setting for people who set themselves apart and also people who set themselves to contemplate and also people who seek uh, new pleasures and new dangers. I, I know that people who go mountain climbing, of course, um, become one with nature and they have to struggle uh, to overcome nature. Uh, and that is sort of what many writers and many romantics would say is typical of man's core nature. And that is to confront challenges, to confront the infinite and to overcome um, huge odds. Oh. Wonderful. And um, to go back to Nietzsche again, yes, because um, I've not actually read much Nietzsche, but the one thing I have read of his is his The Birth of Tragedy, which was the very first piece of writing he ever published. Mm. And um, yeah, the idea of the, um, in tragedy, but in art, the Dionysian versus the Apollonian. And mm. um, I have to say, I think romanticism is quite Dionysian, as in, well, for just for the audience, you know, Dionysian art, obviously the god Dionysus, the Greek god of, of wine and revelry. So he, Nietzsche defined Dionysianism as being, it's all about emotion and it also has a bit of a dark side to it because there's almost a, um, there's like an abstract nature to it. And um, I think we'll see the, those elements will come up in romantic painting. And in contrast, you have Apollonian, which is obviously the, um, Apollo, the god of the sun, uh, which is a very kind of confident, strong god that um, is very, very sure of himself. So complete opposite of the Dionysus. Yeah, uh, so what what you had there is sort of, and, and, and Nietzsche said, you need both of these sides. Um, he, you know, he, he, he talked about sort of the Apollonian as becoming um, predominant, especially after the Enlightenment, where logos, where so the logic, where the word, where rationality had overwhelmed the more primitive urges the urge for sort of group culture for uh, expression of extreme emotions of violence of uh, debauchery of um, desire of lust of um, anger and so forth that these were necessary qualities that could not be foregone and that the enlightenment had sought to banish this and he, he said basically it was from socrates onwards the, the Apollonian had become transcend, uh, um, uh, dominant, as it were. And so he said, no, no, what you have in the ideal Attic tragedy before Socrates um, is a combination of both and that you need both. Uh, and so I would say that, uh, yeah, a lot of romantic art, it, it deliberately seeks to embrace the uh, Dionysian and... Uh, so I, I think that's um yeah so i will i think we'll see that sort of this issue coming up again and again in the images that you've selected which i do not know uh which you have uh, hidden from me and which you're going to release upon us <laughs> yes certainly and um yeah let's move on so with the images i've got there's as I said, there's 20 in total but the rest of them i've actually included um i've done in chronological order and i've only done between 1790 and to about 1840 because I think that's where that was the romantic period proper but there is one at the end which I think is a bit later I think about 1860. Uh, so for the first one uh, after the title card uh, we've actually got one by William Blake so a uh, very important figure in the English romantic movement. Uh, Blake is more known I think as being um, a writer and he kind of came up with his own sort of poetry and it's sort of like a national myth of, for England and um, with this particular art called Albion Rose. So in sort of Blake's mythology, uh, Britain was named after this Titan supposedly called Albion, uh, who was, I think, the son of Poseidon. And he sort of comes to Britain and, you know, the land is then named after him. And um, you can see there's like a, a wonderful, like, explosion of colour um, in this artwork. And um, if we're talking about um, romanticism being ideal, idyllic you know you've got this very virile um sort of well-built man sort of 
trading forth with energy um, any comment you want to make alexander uh yeah so blake's a sort of key figure in romanticism uh and, and his romanticism of course is very much tied in with christianity um because he's a sort of a mystic christian and you'll find that in romanticism there's a lot of sort of pre-christianity ideas so the ideas of paganism and so forth which I'm, I'm sure we'll touch on but um yeah and and obviously the albion rose um story is not strictly speaking christian but um like sort of theosophists as it were blake would have found a way to sort of fold it into a continuum of which christianity was the culmination and so he was blake was very influenced by um michelangelo and in some ways you could see this as a very uh, apollonian image of the rational the enlightened the the uh, illuminated so i mean the, there are some paintings by blake where he sort of delves into sort of madness and obscurity and um sort of violence and so forth but this is quite an apollonian vision um, and he was, um, he, he was, um, I believe, he practiced new uh, natu naturism, as it were. So he, 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 you could be seen in his garden in, I think it was in Peckham. You could, I, could, I don't think you could get away with this now, but um, he used to sort of wander around naked. Um, I, I really uh, in, 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 well, in, in his garden, I should, I, I should add. Yeah. So. Um, yeah. Oh, interesting. And um, that's actually another thing we should touch on. So one of the other key concepts of romanticism is the power of nature. And obviously we saw that in the previous one where, you know, he's the figures mountain climbing and he's in, in like the rural environments. But here again, um, just want to address a comment from Lady of Shalott. Yes, the, the dark satanic mills, as I mm. mentioned in his poem, Jerusalem. Yeah, uh, can, Blake absolutely hated the Industrial Revolution and, and even... The romantic movement as a whole, I think, very much wanted to resist the Industrial Revolution as they saw this um, increasing materialization of life and um, the abandonment of, of nature. Yeah. Um, hi to Lady of Shalotta and to everyone in the chat. Um, yeah. So th there was this idea of um, wanting to... The, the romantics, of course, this sort of... They only could have ar arisen as an upshot of... The industrial revolution and the enlightenment but of course they're ostensibly opposed to many aspects of you know industrialization despoilation of uh, of the land um the severing of the connection between the people and the land um which becomes a very much a hot topic when you get onto the subject of nation building or the nation building through culture and so forth um but yeah so so they were so they were very much to do with sort of um the romantics were very much to do with you know getting in touch with nature going into the rawest aspects uh, rawest places so you have um people like um george borrow and other people uh, um uh dr johnson for example of going of them going into the the roughest most uncouth landscape um because in the part in certainly in the sort of uh, in the 18th century and earlier the mountains were not places that you went um lots of coastal areas or marshes were places that you avoided because there were bandits it was seen as a lawless place it was seen as um unpredictable or wild there were still wild animals that you could um, which could you know injure you or kill you so and there was something there seen something seen as something sort of um strange or terrifying or or um degraded or bizarre about the extreme landscape so the extreme landscape of the mountain of course is the most common one and so you had people s starting uh, uh with um in the 18th century starting to consciously seek out these dangerous places to go to these um uh, far places so you'd um so dr johnson would go to the scottish isles and he would talk about their customs precisely because they were so far from london they were governed from london they were ostensibly part of the the british people or the british peoples i should say um but they were you know completely unfamiliar to most people in the country and so he was seeking out these sort of 
primitive peoples, these people who lived in harmony with nature or had to master the rigors of nature. And so you find that again and again coming up in um, romanticism and uh, even though, you know, Dr. Johnson was a product of the Enlightenment, um, you find this engagement with wild spaces and primitive people. And some of these primitive people are even your countrymen, your ostensibly your fellow countrymen. Mm, no, certainly the, uh, the urban and, and rural clash. Mm, and, mm. Um, mm. Yes. And yeah, and so you got you got the spread of the cities, and you know, due to the um, uh, the industrial revolution, of course, the op and how do you how do you counterbalance that? Well, you embrace the primitive, you embrace the not just the rural, but the pre-rural, the uncultivated, the wild, um, and so that this is this is when you have the sort of the cult of nature arising as a direct antidote to um, the rationalism. Of the Enlightenment and the industrialization of the Industrial Revolution. Mm -mm. Well, no, thank you for that. We'll get a bit more into the cult of the primitive later. Uh, so, for the next painting, oh, uh, yeah, so here we've got one very famous painting from Francisco Goya. So, this is the 3rd of May, 1808. So, uh, this is a scene from the uh, Peninsula War. So, this is when Napoleon Bonaparte invades, deposes the, I believe it's Ferdinand II. Um, of Spain yes, okay. and puts his brother on the throne and um, yes you have this um, sort of Spanish nationalist uprising against the French invaders obviously helped by the, the helped by the British but um, obviously within Lodz or Paint again another key pillar of romanticism is sort of national character or national awakening and um, I think Spain very much well you see this throughout Europe as a consequence of the French Revolution but Spain very much has one uh, in the Peninsula War, and um, here you see this sort of firing squad executing these um, these sort of Spanish martyrs. So again, you've got martyrs of, in a national cultural sense rather than a, necessarily a religious sense. Yeah. So there, there were there were two paintings that Goya did. There was the second of May, which shows the um, the Madrileños, the the people of Madrid rising up and attacking the French soldiers who were sort of supporting um, and protecting the, 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 the puppet king of um, the French. And here we see the consequences. So that uprising failed. The people who took part in it were arrested, tried. And then um, on the early in the morning of the following day, the 3rd of May, they were executed by firing squad by the um, French soldiers. Uh, and so, yes, yeah, so this is part of the national sort of myth making, the mythos of um, the the sort of the the character of the Spanish being sort of noble and wanting um, sort of a self determination. Not necessarily. I, I don't think you could necessarily say that Goya was a republican. He was he was a court artist for the uh, for the Bourbons, but. Um, he, he's got Goya's got something of a, an ambiguous relationship with the Enlightenment and with Romanticism because obviously he's romantic. He's a he's very fascinated by the irrational side, um, by dreams, by superstition, by um, the the more peculiar aspects of uh, religious thought and worship, um, uh, and sort of also to do with uh, sort of pre-christianity the sort of the monsters and demons and witches and so forth oh yes because you've got but, the uh, the black paintings um so mm. he did yeah yeah so so the black paintings are um a classic example of this so this is you know where he paints um all sorts of uh, peculiar rites and rituals you see monsters you see people fighting um yeah, so and, and it was a sort of a, a cavalcade of sort of weird and grotesque things. And you're not quite sure if he's celebrating it or criticizing it. And that's one of the things that it, it comes up again in the literature when you when you re research Goya. So some people say, well, you know, he was really critical of the church. He was really critical of superstition. Um, but in another way, you can see it as sort of like as this as a refuge from the 
overdeveloped Apollonian qualities of the Enlightenment, that he, he was genuinely fascinated by the subconscious. And he genuinely understood that there was more to man than pure logic and pure reason. And so once you get into that area, you are romantic and you are not necessarily progressive. You know, you're starting to be critical of the ideas of democracy and nationhood as opposed to fealty to a king and or, you know, sort of Protestant religious autonomy opposed to following the dictates of the Catholic Church and so forth. So is he is he for this or is he against this? There's quite a degree of ambiguity in what he does, uh, even though he's ostensibly classed as a sort of progressive or reformer or anti-traditional person. Um, there's there's ammunition both ways, ways I think. No, certainly. And um, it's probably worth mentioning at this point that another core pillar of um, romanticism is the intensity of emotion. So again, we've talked about it being a rejection of the Enlightenment. Well, again, the Enlightenment is an Apollonian. It's, uh, you know, as Nietzsche described it, Apollonianism, the ideal Apollonian art is like the marble statue. So it's completely rock solid, very physical, whereas Dionysian is this intense sort of emotion, even dark melancholy in some ways. And, you know, if we're mm. talking about Goya and the black paintings, well, I can't think of anything more Dionysian than those black paintings. And yeah. um, if we're looking at this, you know, you look at the emotion, you look at the, the horrified look on the man who's about to be shot um, and the inherent violence of the, the bloody corpse on the floor um, and, you know, the repulsion as the people cower. Um, it's obviously there to elicit a really strong emotional response from the, from the viewer. Yeah, and but you could also say that the man, the man in the white shirt, of course, is the is the Christ figure. He is being martyred, and he is perhaps not objecting. He's saying, "Here I am. I am. I am. I am Spanish. I am from Madrid. I am um, a follower of the King. I'm a follower of the Church. Um, you know, the the Napole Napoleon. I think was not strictly speaking an atheist, but you know, he was." He, he took control of a of a republic that was um, ostensibly atheist. So you know you could say that well you know he is the the, the figure in white is um, actually welcoming his martyrdom. And you see I mean you see the friar uh, on towards the front. So there were there were there were religious people um, people in religious orders who took part in or supported or protected some of the revolutionaries, the, the rebels, and they were also included in the um, uh, executions. Mm. I actually didn't notice that that was a friar, but now that I look, you're right, it is. And um, it's actually interesting because you talk about this idea of national character and blood soil paint. Well, I think this is a really interesting rearticulation because we always think of the Spanish as being these um, very sort of zealous Catholics, and um, especially if you if you look at their history, you know, you've got, you know, in the 8th century, the Arab Muslims invade, conquer most of the peninsula, and it's for centuries them slowly trying to claw their, basically, a, a new country um, mm. out of out of this frontier. And so they've always kind of got this um, sort of strong Christian character to to them. And, you know, they're, they're always very, very jealous and, and feisty, so to speak. So... Yeah, and, and so and Goya was was he was I think he was classed as a, as an agnostic really, uh, and he but he was associated with uh, this will sound familiar with um, the sort of the upper middle class the uh, the intelligentsia who were very much more progressive, more in favour of democracy, opposed to the domination of the Catholic Church more sort of scientifically minded, more rational. And yet, of course, Goya makes his name, certainly with us, through his sort of his romantic images, through his images of insanity and murder and superstition and so forth. Uh, but, you know, it, it, sort of politically, he was classed as a sort of as a liberal. Um, so I, I don't know if that helps. I want to thank you. It's um. I don't know that that much about about Goya other than his art, so it's always good to le learn new things about artists. So, yeah, and 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 Goya, Goya is a particularly uh, complex artist as well, and he's 
as I said, there's a, there's a lot of evidence on both ways. So it's it's really interesting that you know this is this has taken up as an image of national heroism, and it and it certainly is. But it's also it was seen at the time. Um, well, also you got to remember this was painted a few years afterwards, after the um, the Bourbons had been um, restored. So this was uh, after the um, Napoleonic. Um, uh, a, a regent, as it were, has been deposed, uh, and so this is this is sort of painted in the knowledge that you know Span Spain is under Spanish control once again. Uh, so he's he's got a degree of sort of freedom um, that he wouldn't have had if he'd actually painted yes. it in eighteen oh eight. So yeah. yeah, that's a fair point. So I suppose he's sort of commemorating the the event for the future. Yes, yeah, and this this was and this was seen as his, you know, this was he, seen as him making a big public statement about his um, his admiration for the Spanish who um, stood up for Spain, even though actually a lot of the liberals remember he's he's classed as a liberal and he's a liberal sympathizer. A lot of the liberals actually supported the French imposter, so he's kind of he's dealing from the. Top and the bottom of the pack, as it were. Um, yes, uh, th th that is that is true. I do remember reading that a uh, a lot of people with those sympathies were sympathetic to the French and just, just yeah, because, we, because we, yeah, because because the you know the French Revolution was the embodiment. I mean, regardless of what it became, it was the embodiment of rationality, of modernity, of logic that you would do away with the king because this is to do with superstition. It's to do with inheritance it's it's it to do with sort of loyalty to an old order the uh, the revolution is logic it's science it's building the new man this is this is you know the story of um, the soviet union as well so the 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 french revolution was seen as the great modern liberation it was the scene of sound it was like people becoming man being able to fulfill his ability freed from the shackles of superstition and the church and the crown so obviously liberals all around the world um sort of um were very enthusiastic about the principles of the french revolution even if they didn't necessarily uh, agree with the entire outcome no of course and uh on that i think we should uh, move on so Okay, so this is the first painting uh, that we've seen that is actually one you bring up in Blood Soil Paint. So this is The Bard by John Martin. And um, what we see here um, is, because I actually did some research about this, and so what this painting is supposed to depict is, um, so in the 13th century, you have the um, the conquest of Wales by Edward I, uh, Longshanks. And um, what they're supposed to be is we sort of see in the bottom left, we've got like this on this sort of, pack of like people like this entourage is supposed to be like I think um a lot of Welsh on the run and um the, the bards the figure in the top right who's up in the um on top of the mountain uh is supposed to be like a heroic Welsh bard who's going to sort of carry on the sort of the national memory of Wales um through the ages essentially. Yeah so so this is a sort of a scene of um uh yeah so obviously you had people you had the romantic artists sort of embracing the idea of um national character and especially the original national peoples um so these would be the you know the, the celts or you know the, the welsh and so forth and so you would and so there was a lot of a lot of imagery of um uh you know the sort of the romans versus the the native britons uh, with a sympathy towards the the Britons that had not previously existed very much. Um, certainly, you know, when you had sort of poets and um, so forth from earlier times, they were a lot more sympathetic towards the Romans because the Romans sort of brought civilization. They brought um, building in stone. They brought their own aspects of science and law and logic. Uh, the order of um, just their language and which went on to sort of form the basis of modern Britain as it were um, and the and that it was very difficult to sort of blend in 
the the Gauls and the Celts and the Picts um, into this story because they were kind of they they kind of sort of disappeared up into the hills. Their their culture had not been uh, had not been not been largely preserved or studied. There was there was very little written record because it was an oral culture and so forth. And then suddenly, in the end of the eighteenth century, beginning of the nineteenth century, when you have the Romantics, you have the start of this swell of sympathy and interest in native peoples so this is a, a typical scene by john martin i think this painting's in newcastle in the lang gallery and gallery that i know quite well if you've ever been to wales i should you know, you'll probably know that the landscape in the background is highly exaggerated because of course john martin was famous for exaggerating uh apocalyptic landscapes and doing these these incredibly steep cliffs and towering mountains and um you know sort of dramatic clouds and stuff and he was particularly noted for his paintings of hell and of um biblical destruction and so forth it's really well worth looking up because he's like um mm -hmm. he's essentially like a sort of a cinema director of sort of a um the director of a sort of um disaster picks from uh but sort of dating from the um the uh early, from the georgian period so he's sort of like he's a He's the director of apocalyptic films, but he's just working. He happens to work on canvas, and he's working um, two hundred years ago. Uh, yes, I did notice a lot of them when I was look, researching paintings for the stream. There's like one of him at like Pandemonium, and then there's one of like the Seventh Plague of Egypt, and what is yeah, that? The Fall of Sodom and Gomorrah, and the the, yes. the opening of the Seventh Seal, and yeah, oh yes, absolutely. I mean, they're, they're all fantastic. You've got these fantastic sort of zigzagging lightning bolts and. Um, sort of giant, uh, incredible sort of mountains being lifted up and hurled over. I and mean, they are quite astonishing pictures. So they're well worth checking out. Mm. Um, yeah, so of course you say this is exaggerated, but I think, again, it's is it just adds to the, the fantasy that, you know, you've mm. got this um, wild sort of warrior bard sort of, and he's climbed these epic mountains and he's going to, keep the uh the welsh spirit and 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 you know legends going down the ages yeah so so then there was in this interest in magic as well in sort of pre the in pre-christian history and so forth and so the bard of course was a sort of a symbol of welsh culture the oral culture the culture of singing of um reciting verse memorizing verse and because you know it's, it was all memorized it was, very little of it was written down and so he was sort of like a a figure he was like a he was an arthur for the welsh so you know arthur sort of disappears and he will be king arthur will be reborn and he will return um at some stage and this is the same sort of um feeling that well you have this bard and although he's going out into the wilderness he may at some time return and lead to um, the overthrow of the English. Um, but um, yeah, we're still waiting for that. Mm, indeed. And um, another thing is, along with Romanticism, you also kind of get a revival of um, medievalism in this time as well. And um, if you especially look at novels by like people such as Walter Scott, and um, obviously you've talked the idea of a bard, you know, this sort of musical performer and singer, but then that's something that is very much bound up with our image of the Middle Ages, especially if you look at um, the troubadour culture of the south of France, you know, um, Occitania and, and et cetera. Yeah, uh, and this this flows into the arts and crafts movement, which is right at the end of the 19th century, where you have this sort of um, the fascination with illustrated manuscripts, you know, from the sort of the medieval period, from the sort of the almost the Gothic period, um, that, that becomes and and the very absence of records makes something like uh, the Dark Ages um, fascinating. So you can start sort of uh, because there is so little that's firmly known, or so there's so little visual material which is commonly understood. Um, that means it gives you a, a, a license to be extremely inventive. Hmm. No, so, oh yes, sorry. Was... Should, should, and Shaw should, should mention that the power of the imagination, of course, is absolutely core um, to uh, romantic thinking as well. I know it's always good to be a bit inventive and creative when you're an artist. So, 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, artists like John Martin would be, they would go out into the landscape and they would draw and they would record things in sort of watercolour sketches and so forth. And then when they got back to the studio, and this is an oil painting on canvas, they would, um, obviously they would combine their sketches and exaggerate them and they would use their imagination to fuse these things. But they're convincing because, of course, he, like, you know, pretty much all other artists, went out into the landscape and were familiar with how to draw and paint um, nature to depict um, shading correctly and so forth. So this is what allows him to fuse his imagination into, um, uh, you know, sort of a, a finished convincing work of art. Mm, certainly. And um, another point I should bring up is, um, because we've been talking about the core pillars of romanticism, but another one which I think is important to mention is the uh, the concentration and the promotion of sort of the individualist, the individual or individualism. And so in all the paintings we've looked at thus far, with the exception of the Goya one, it's always centred on like one figure. So like you've obviously got the, um, the the chap in the first one where he's climbed up the mountain. Then you've got like the bard who's up mm. in here. And then you've got the um, obviously Alb Albion Rose. But um, cause it's also interesting because when looking at romanticism that you've kind of got a bit of a contradiction because not only does it focus on individualism, it also proclaims them sort of universal brotherhood through like a national people. So you can almost say it's individualist, but it's also like egalitarian as well. Yeah, so they're, they're trying to straddle two things. So with the rise of the Enlightenment, you've got the idea of, um, you know, sort of a, pro sort of a, a Christian idea of individual souls having merit and value and each one being precious and being in the image of God. And but you've also got this idea of um, democracy, of uh, equality under the law, about the abolition of tyrants, about the establishment of um, democratic forms and forums, the idea of uh, the application of science, which will be made open to everyone, the expansion of the franchise, which admittedly it seems a little bit slow it doesn't really pick up until the end of the 19th century but you know this is sort of bubbling away and you know there's the idea of the the, uh, the abolition of um slavery as well so there are all sorts of moves towards sort of liberal individualism and this has to be squared with the rise of nationalism so where what happens is you with the rise of the French Revolution, you have the severing between the the ordinary person and their priest and their lord, who has fealty to the king, and the king has um, is submissive and does the work of God through Christ. So once those links are cut, where are your ties? where are your loyalties who is your master and who is your brother well according to the french revolution there are no masters you're all brothers but what do you actually have in common what do you have in common with someone who lives on you know, if you live in normandy what do you have in common with someone who lives in marseille or lives in the alps i mean you sort of have a language but you've got your own dialect religion well you know some of them are some of you are catholic some of you are protestant and if you're a true believer in the revolution then you're an atheist so what have you got in common you've got your nationhood and how do you express that what does that mean well that's what the romantics start to do they start to look into what binds us together as a people it's very often they go back to pre-christianity they go back to time before national kings, the time before a common church. And so that's why there's this interest in primitivism, because this is something that ostensibly links all of us, unless we are, you know, recent immigrants. It links all of us in a sort of common bond of history. So this is why, although we're talking about something that looks quite old, it's to do with, you know, your ancestors from 2000 years ago is quite a modern thing and it's being talked of now in sort of 
1800 or 1790 specifically so that you feel some kinship with someone who has the same citizenship who lives on the other side of your country um because ultimately you know the rulers they need to get you together but how are they going to get you together if they if you don't have this chain this great chain of being as it were up through your priests towards god or up through your lord to your king if that has been severed you have to rely on much more sort of nebulous things like a sort of uh, ancestral memory or sort of ethnic ties and so forth which i'm not saying are not real things but they're being called upon at this time specifically because so many other ties have been cut. Mm, no, and um, I think very much with Romanticism and the 19th century, I think there's a conscious effort to try and make national character. And I think there's a very famous quote from an Italian nationalist whose name I'm blanking on, but the quote was um, it's something they said after Italian unification in the 1860s. We've made Italy, now we have to make Italians. Mm. Yeah, so you, you have a problem of, like, this is a particularly a problem for nations like Italy and Germany. Um, the Romantics, of course, this is principally a Northern European movement as well, which is kind of interesting. But yeah, so it, it, countries like Germany and Italy have a particular problem that they need this national mythos because they have been separate principalities, kingdoms, um, uh, dukedoms, bishoprics, they've been completely isolated, not, well, not isolated, but they've been completely distinct. They've been very different. They've had alliances and ties, but they've also been fighting each other. They sometimes have different religions. They speak um, sometimes different dialects. They are praying in different ways. They're using different, um, different texts, different scriptures and so forth. So <laughs> There was, there was a big problem in Italy and in Germany, uh, specifically where they unify their country technically, but actually it's a whole bunch of people who just happen to speak more or less the same language and live in a sort of contiguous area. But actually, they would never actually coexisted properly as Italians or as Germans. And so this is when a sort of nationalism and the romantic drive towards unification becomes particularly important. Indeed, and um, I think with Germany and Italy, um, not so much art, but I think um, music and opera are very important in trying to make national cultures, because um, with Germany, you've got people like Wagner, and in Italy, you've got um, Giuseppe Verdi, um, especially, mm, so. Yeah. Oh, yes, Lady of Shalot, Shalot um, mentions that um, I recently wrote an article for um, my Substack, I'll just um, briefly mentioned that is uh, Alexander Adams art dot substack dot com and she mentioned that Ava Zobsky uh, a, a um, uh, an Armenian well Russian Armenian slash Ukrainian Crimean painter from the uh, late from well from the 19th century um, who painted some fantastic pictures I did an article on him and, and um, noted how um he's become sort of a, a national a national figure and he was acclaimed at the time particularly by the armenians and you know when you have a you know with without you know with due respect armenia is a relatively small country and not a particularly populous country and a lot of uh, big diaspora as well and these small nations tend to be extremely proud of particular figures who they hold up as heroes so in armenia's case it's uh, avazovsky um, so it's it's worth uh, checking out um, uh, my article on Substack if you're interested. No, no, certainly that's fascinating. And um, the problem of you know who who gets to claim um, certain artists of the past is um, interesting. So I remember um, it was an episode of UO, I think either last year or the year before, where um, I think it was this Russian artist. I'm really blanking on the name, but he's a piece of art that was called Russian Dancers and they decided to rename it to Ukrainian Dancers. Uh -huh, and right. I can, I, okay, I can give you the inside story on that. So this is actually Degas. So it's Edgar Degas, the French Impressionist. And he right. did yeah, he did a series of pictures of 
dancers, uh, a, a troupe of a traveling troupe of dancers um, who were actually who were who were called Russian, but they were actually Ukrainian. This wasn't quite the snub that people assumed that it was, because basically anyone from that region, anyone from the Russian Empire, because Ukraine was part of the Russian Empire, Empire at the time, were referred to routinely as Russians. So uh, I'm sorry that the you know the Georgians and the Armenians and the you know and the Lithuanians and so forth they were they were just called they were all called Russians by foreigners because it, frankly it was very difficult to tell them apart and so that's why and, and you know at the time you know a lot of a lot of people um, who travel abroad it was just simpler to say yes I'm a, yes I'm a Russian rather than no I'm actually a Ukrainian or you know whatever I'm trying to explain it because that's the way things were. So the dance troupe was routinely promoted in France, in Paris, specifically as Russian dancers, even though we do know they were Ukrainian because there's been analysis of the costumes and the costumes are Ukrainian. So there's been this retitling, especially since the outbreak of the war between Ukraine and Russia, there's been a retitling of paintings called the Russian dancers as the Ukrainian dancers. So there you go. Hmm. Oh, well, in interesting that uh, the story is not, not as we first thought. So thank you for that, Alexander. So uh, My pleasure. I should also point out that I've written a book on um, Degas that was published by Prestel. And I think the last image in that book is actually the Ukrainian dancers. And so, yeah, so I actually, I actually wrote a little bit about this already. Oh, interesting. Well, I have to give that a read someday. Uh, so let's move on. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, so got one very famous painting from John Constable, the Hay Wayne. So again, we talked about the importance of nature to romanticism. And um, so you've got this lovely little English country um, painting here. We've got the cottage and we've got the, um, the trees, the fields and um, the little stream. Um, really cosy, lovely painting. And um, I hate to bring this up, but it does remind me of another story that was on UO once where because I think it wasn't it just stop oil once tried to vandalize them. This painting, didn't they, Alexander? Yes, they did. Well they they managed it. They didn't just try, they managed it. They um they they papered over it with their 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 nonsense, their propaganda. And uh, strangely they were not stopped. You'd you'd think that a painting of this importance would be properly protected and that people interfering with it would be prevented from doing so, but uh, Apparently not. Um, it's almost as if the staff of the National Gallery have some sort of sympathy with these causes. But, um, mm -hmm. uh, further than that, I will not venture. So, yeah, so this is uh, John Constable. Um, it's interesting because this is actually, we think of this as a bucolic scene, but it's actually it's a working landscape. So on the left, you've got the mill. And then what you've got in the farmer, his, he's, what he's doing is he stopped the his cart, his hay wine in the stream in order to um uh in order to make the wood swell so that um the the rim of the wheels doesn't come loose uh, and break the wheel so it's basically he's tightening it's, it's basically he's you know it's like he's he's putting air in his tires as it were effectively he's making sure that the wheels are working properly um, so he's only pausing briefly to make sure that the, the wood swells and then he gets um, back onto the track. Uh, oh, and, that's very... Yeah, and, and, this is, uh, and this is also um, uh, home territory for Constable Constable's family owned property in the area. Uh, and so this was sort of, this was a common scene and um, uh, he, he felt, he felt, uh, you know, he, he was a patrician and he wanted to depict the working people that he knew so well who were who were basically um peasants and craftsmen and tradesmen and artisans who worked for his family um his family wasn't sort of super wealthy but it was you know it was sort of gentry so he wanted to sort of pay homage to them and you find that um, one aspect of romanticism is the looking at the way peasants worked in the land uh, and were part of the land and were bound to the land. Um, and obviously that relates to sort of national character of blood and soil, you know, the tie between blood and soil 
um, that's what led to the titling of my book, um, Blood, Soil, Paint. And um, I just want to address a comment from Reactionary Reading Law. I don't think it was the real one. Um, I'm assuming he's talking about the evangelization. Well, um, yeah, well, I, I hear quite often you hear the thing of like, well, these aren't the original paintings, that these are sort of replicas and so forth. Um, I, I don't know about that, but um, yeah, I, I think I think that it was um, they, the the painting, the paper was applied to was applied to the canvas. Um, I, th I think it was I think it was a real one, um, and there was sort of like a sort of photocopy printout was sort of um, papered over it. Uh, as, as far as I know, and there was there was actual damage. You can't you can't press on. You can't sort of. This isn't like a wall. Which doesn't give. So you, you you've got you you get a piece of paper and you slap it on the wall, and it just sort of sticks or it doesn't stick, but it doesn't really damage the wall. You, when you do that to a canvas which has got oil paint on it and varnish, uh, it's still actually quite flexible, and the canvas below is it flexes, it moves. So when you push on it, you have a solid surface which is on a soft backing, so it cracks. So when you apply when you apply your your propaganda um, photocopies on top of this surface and you press on it, you're actually cracking the paint surface. So it, it does do some damage. Mm -hmm. Tragedy. Yeah. Such a thing should, should never happen, but we live in the times that we live in. Uh, yeah, sadly, yeah. Ah, uh, uh, yes, yeah, so... Here's another one that you talk about in the book, um, Gothic Church Ruins by uh, Karl Blecker. And um, so obviously along with Romanticism, you also see the uh, what you might call the Gothic Revival, which is um, an architectural movement where you're starting to see a lot of um, buildings being made in the Gothic style. And um, so obviously you see a lot of dark use of shadows in this painting. and. Um, Something you say, uh, Alexander, in the book is um, the figure you can just sort of make out um, at, towards the bottom of the image is almost like he's part of the the landscape, as sort of nature is reclaiming this uh, this sort of ruin, as it were. Yeah. So when you have that, when you have the revival, when you have the sort of the the, the Gothic revival, which happens in the nineteenth century, um, uh, for example, like the people don't know that the the Houses of Parliament were. <coughs> Uh, in London were rebuilt after burning down uh, and that um, what you see was built in the 19th century it's not it's not a particularly old building but it was built in a sort of gothic revival in a sort of um, in a non so it's specifically non-classical style it's non-latin it's not non-roman it's a sort of it's a sort of a throwback to the gothic art of the Dark Ages and the early, um, uh, the early um, ca um, cathedrals, for example, of sort of Cologne and Rheim and um, uh, and uh, uh, the other sort of uh, Chartres, particularly. Mm -hmm. So the, the, you have this this fascination with the Gothic, which is seen as being more attuned to the weather and the temperament of the people of the north because there was this idea that well if we can make art about ourselves art that's going to be truly national we have to give up these foreign forms so we're going to have to give up uh latin uh latin verse and latin versification latin words and go back to more uh, to sort of the the vernacular, to the words lifted from the old languages, from the old people, and the buildings will look more as they did in the Dark Ages, when it's sort of in a post um, post Roman Empire world, where people are inspired by the landscape. So the idea about the the Gothic, the, co the common discussion about the Gothic is that the Gothic is um based on strong verticals and you have these sort of um these arches the sort of the spiked arches which um relate to tree branches uh and that these are these are sort of uh in sort of they 
indicates the landscape of the north. So these are large deciduous trees with their curving boughs in a way that when you go to, you know, uh, to Italy or to Greece and so forth, you see lots of small trees um, because it's a very different environment. It's a lot rockier at the, the temperatures are a lot higher. You get your olive trees, you get your orange trees, and they're not particularly tall and they don't have these big sort of sort of sweeping branches. Um, they've got a very different quality to them. So the idea is that, well, your art should reflect your landscape, should reflect your um, trees, should reflect your people. And so this was one of the ideas of um, the Gothic revival was it's supposed to be closer to your authentic national character. Mm. No, certainly. And because um, I remember when I was studying for my degree many years ago, Alexander, I looked a lot at the work of them. Um, A.W. Pugin, um, the sort of Catholic revival um, artist who um, or archi built art, sort of architecture um, yes, and yes, um, because he's the one who was responsible for actually rebuilding the House of Parliament, and he also built um, a lot of them um, sort of Gothic Catholic cathedral um, buildings, mm. including um, St Chad's in Birmingham. So, yeah, yeah. So, so th th this is yeah. I mean, here, yeah. So Pugin, and also you know. Uh, thinker like Ruskin, for example, very interested in architecture and so forth. He was he was an advocate of the of the Gothic, of the non of the non Roman, of the non Hellenic, of the non classical, and that's why he becomes involved with uh, the pre Raphaelites and the arts and crafts movement because these are these are movements uh, and Gothic revival, um, because these are movements which are specifically tied to northern forms, to sort of the northern genius. Um, so, yeah, that's right. Mm. And um, something else I want to bring up is because um, um, Spengler um, in Decline of the West has a really interesting take on Romanticism, because um, obviously when he talks about um, the Western man, the Faustian man, he says, you know, their prime architectural symbol is the uh, the Gothic cathedral, the sort of the endless space because of how tall and, and big they are and um and it's because it, he sort of says that um romanticism and the gothic revival were sort of like the west sort of finding its own sort of identity and character again after uh, many many centuries um and sort of rejecting because then um, there's another point of his that because he, he felt the um the classical people were a completely different civilization and um he, he felt things like the Neoclassicism and the um, people, things like the Renaissance were kind of a LARP, and uh, so the the West is being true to itself again, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, I mean that's that's uh, that's perfectly in thinking with um, people who were seeking to have sort of found na the, found or refound national schools of art uh, in the sort of in the sort of nineteenth century. So Spengler's obviously writing afterwards he's sort of looking retrospectively on this but yeah a lot of people were saying well you know these these latin things i mean oh it's a great civilization but it's not necessarily suited for northern europe and that's why i think northern europe um particularly britain and germany and to a lesser extent scandinavia and northern france and so forth they're they're particularly big on uh, the Romantic movement, because this allows them a space for the expression of national character, which is distinct from um, Hellenic, um, Latin and classical art and architecture. And so, for example, you get these weird movements of um, sort of authenticity, as it were. So, for example, um, if you've ever wondered why, because um, you, you, have, you have this sort of struggle between sort of embracing the latin or embracing the roman as ideal or reacting against it very strongly so for example if you've ever wondered why the americans tend to use a z in the i z s uh you know to to memorize they would use it with the z uh and we tend to use it with an s well that's because there was a spelling reform british don't really do spelling reforms we don't have a language authority but um, there was some movement, I can't particularly remember who who it was, but he was said basically, you know, there should be no Z, we shouldn't be using Zs in our language because there was no Z in Latin. And 
why should we be using this sort of this this old this sort of you know obviously so you know not a name like a name like Z Zephaniah or Zebedee or stuff you you have to have the Z at the beginning because it's a particular sound but if you're going to have it in the word especially in the verbs you know verb forms memorize and initialize and so forth why would you have the Z it's um it shouldn't be there it should if these are Latin words and most of our languages derive from Latin then we should have just an S. And so that's how come um, British spelling has kind of purged the Z, um, but it has remained in America because the Americans um, didn't, um, had already established their British English traditions before this spelling reform took place in Britain. So there's an oddity for you. Oh, that's fascinating. I, I've never knew why the why there was that difference. So that's um, good to know. Yeah. It's it, it, it's weird to think that you would reform your own language, which is actually a Germanic language more than anything else, and you would deliberately remove a particular character from it because it doesn't fit in with the with the Latin alphabet as used by a different group of people who came in uh, at a later stage. Well, oh, there you go. Mm. So it's interesting how all these different influences and coalesce and and such. So mm. okay. So here we go. So for this one, uh, we've got Lord Byron on his deathbed. So obviously Lord Byron, very famous figure within the Romantic movement, um, obviously great poet. And um, what this um, painting is sort of commenting on is because obviously during this time, you have the Greek War of Independence, which is um, so obviously you've got the creation of like a national Greek character in their sort of rebellion against the Ottoman Empire. And um, Byron went off famously and fought in that war and... Um, tragically died um and um it's interesting and so here you've kind of got this very idealized um depiction of his um of, of his death and where he's sort of all kitted up like a greek hero and um and it's yeah especially yeah. idealized because because um of the other club foot and uh they've kind of covered it up um so to speak so Yes, I, I, I noticed that. Yeah, so yeah, so Byron went to fought uh, to fight in the Greek War of Independence uh, against the Ottomans, uh, and this was a cause that was taken up by a lot of people because they were great admirers of um, Greek culture. So it's kind of natural that they would have more sympathy with the Greeks, uh, who were also Christian as opposed to the Ottomans, who were um, Muslim. So there's natural, more, naturally, more affinity with the Greeks than there was with the Ottomans. And so he went to fight for Greek independence and died actually of a fever, I believe. Uh, so, yeah, so, and obviously Byron, a towering figure in the Romantic movement uh, as a poet. Um, and, yeah, so you, so you see what they've done here is they've given, although they've actually treated him in quite a sort of neoclassical way, you could imagine sort of someone like David or Agra painting this sort of picture um you know because you've got like sort of you've got the classical you've got the classical drapery you've got the classical um furniture so the sort of the the divan is sort of sort of the the typical sort of um greek divan of um classical times um uh, so uh, yeah so this is sort of like a it's a it's kind of a fusion of of classicism and romanticism um heroizing the, the great uh, lord byron um so he was he was hugely admired all over Europe. He wasn't he wasn't just a British figure. He was uh, a very he was um, uh, admired and imitated um, by many across Europe. Mm, and um, it's at this point a good point to bring up that um, in Romanticism um, they have this idea of nobility, but not nobility of blood or nobility of your lineage, but nobility of action or character. So it's interesting that with Lord Byron, him being an actual aristocrat, he's actually more venerated for his actions and deeds than he is for his lineage. Yeah, so it was it was this idea that anyone could be heroic if you were acting in a heroic manner. You weren't necessarily born to heroism. It was something that you could take on yourself personally. And yeah, so and, and so he sort of he embodied it um, by actually acting on heroic romantic uh sentiment by defending the liberty and independence of 
or supporting the liberty and independence of a noble and ancient people. And it's also interesting because I've talked earlier about the idea of their contradictions and romanticism, where we were also talking about how there's this embrace of the Gothic and rejection of neoclassical, but you've also got this other side of romanticism, which is embracing the, the neoclassical. Yeah, so so the the neoclassical is 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 very closely is is sort of it's kind of like a fusion of classicism and romanticism, and you'll often like when you're look, when you're going through a museum like the Louvre and so forth, it's it's actually quite tricky to tell apart the romantics from the neoclassical artists. Um, so for an artist like Angra, for example, is someone who's working in sort of both modes. I mean, he's ostensibly he's he's neoclassical. He's a he, he sort of looks to Poussin, he looks to the ancient Greeks and so forth. Um, um, but, you know, he's, he's, doing a, he's doing a few things that are actually quite romantic. He's tackling some romantic subjects and he's got a romantic sensibility sometimes. Mm -hmm. Certainly. Okay. Uh, so here we go. There's another one you talk about um, in the books. This is The Death of Stars Annapolis by Eugene Delacroix. Um, so this is... Um, the one you use when you're talking about Orientalism in the book. And um, for those who have watched my channel, you know that I've done several streams on the idea of Orientalism, uh, specifically looking at art uh, with John D. And I also do a couple of streams with my friend uh, Hunger, looking at the literary Orientalism and uh, critiquing Edward Said's um, work. Um, but this painting I didn't actually look at in those streams of D, though I did look at many other paintings by Delacroix. Um, in, because this was kind of one of his areas of interest and in the Orient. And so, uh, funny enough, we were just talking about Byron. Well, the inspiration for this painting was actually, I think, a poem by Byron um, about the um, death of the, I think it was the Sardinapolis was the last king of Assyria, if I recall correctly. Yeah, so what, what's happening is his, 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 his basically, he's, I think his, his empire, is his kingdom is about to be overthrown uh, and that the enemy is... At the gate and that he knows everything is over so before i believe he he himself commits suicide he asks he he demands the destruction of his harem of his animals of um um you know he's he's basically taking he's taking everyone down with him yeah, mm. yeah. It, it could be dionysian artwork yeah uh, absolutely and you've got and you've got so many different uh, incidents and there's a lot of drama and um i mean the you've got the sort of the the dramatic splashes of red which don't don't really come across in this reproduction but they they are quite striking and then of course you've got the sort of the the idea of these sort of explosive muscular figures of action of death of um grief of people expressing things very physically um so what was something that's we think of it as romantic but of course it comes from the greeks and you know expressing things through physical movement and um and uh, delacroix was sort of as a, you know one of the one of the key romantic figures because he's um he's particularly invested in these sort of extreme dramas uh and sort of extreme incidents and he he actually traveled to uh, algeria just as it became a, a french possession or, or literally territory of France. It was actually incorporated into France. So it became French soil. And um, so he, he went to he went to Algiers and he spent some time um, drawing and painting. I mean, obviously he was particularly interested in sort of capturing authentic costumes and authentic um, furnishings and color schemes, color combinations. He was always taking uh, notes about colors and so forth and uh, um, and the people but curiously enough um it's actually it actually was quite hard at the time to get um muslim women to model for him you know you just it was very difficult to get access to them and it was you know it's quite quite risky so what ended up happening was that he ended up working um um drawing doing sketches of um jews because there was there was more access to Jews than there was to um, Muslims, so you find you find he actually spends quite a lot of time with uh, the Jews of um, Marrakesh and 
um, you know, the, the coast of on the coast of Morocco than he does. Oh, sorry, I, I, sorry. Yeah, so I think he went he went to Morocco and Algeria. So anyway, yeah. So but yeah. So he anyway he spends a lot of time uh, living and drawing uh, Jews and sort of transposing that to Muslims and so forth because um, he, he just didn't have access to um, um, original Muslim models uh, other aside from the men. Oh, that, that's, that's that's really interesting. Um, yeah, because I remember um, one of the paintings me and Dee looked at. This is one of like I think it was just called like the women of Algeria, and it was just a few women in like a um, like sort of lounging about with like a, a, mm. a smoking pipe. So yeah, so uh, and uh, yes, there was some some of this. Um, so some of these things he could he could get access to. So like the the hooker pipe and the and the tiles and the furniture and stuff. I mean that's that's all completely you know authentic and that's derived from and he's combined it in his own way but that's all sort of derived from uh, actual observation but the women are quite possibly jewish um um you know or the, mm. the originals that he he drew yeah wonderful and i've got a couple more um pieces by delacroix so uh here we've got liberty leading the people um he says this is probably i think his most famous one um so this is um uh, so in 1830, uh, there's a revolution in France. The, um, they overthrow the Bourbon Restoration, and um, there's a new um, dynasty comes in. So it's Louis Philippe, the citizen king, uh, is inaugurated, and um, this is what this is depicting. And like I think with the Sardinapolis one, again you've got the, a lot of um, a lot of action going on. Like you've got the uh, the woman at the front with the flag. You've got the young boy. Um, with the guns, and then you've got the uh, the angry mob behind them as they're sort of trampling over all these corpses. <laughs> yes, uh, yes. Yeah, so th this is a famous image of. So here again, we get like the return of. So uh, Delacroix himself was sort of a a minor aristocrat. He was sort of from a branch of the minor aristocracy, and I think his father was su supposed to be Talleyrand, the the great sort of foreign minister. Although that wasn't confirmed, but he was sort of he was minor he was minor aristocracy, um, but uh, sort of politically speak, and and he's he's a snob, he's an elitist, you know, quite rightly, um, and and he looks to great art for you know for example he was uh, inspired by Rubens the style of Rubens and so forth, um, but he was. He was definitely interested in the power of revolution and the power of national sentiment. How how he, I think he was he was skeptical about um, democracy in itself, but I think he was he did believe in national character because he he was forever painting the French or the Greeks. Or um, he, he also did uh, a painting of um, Native Americans and so forth. So he was very interested in national spirit and national character and national resilience, even if he may not have been especially tied to the idea of democracy and, and in particular this sort of uprising of 1830 or the uprising of um, 1848. Uh, I think he was probably not entirely um, in uh, committed to the idea of democracy for itself, uh, but I think he was just sort of, he was a patriot, of course. Mm, I think it's fair that around this time in France and even Britain, you're kind of, you get a lot of these, um what you might call liberal aristocrats. So in France, you very famously got, um, you got um, Alexis de Tocqueville, you know, who wrote mm. Democracy in America and became a, uh, a government minister um in the early 19th century you know in britain you've got people like lord acton for example um as well yeah um, there, there is a, there's always been a sort of a, a lot of sympathy for and, and, and this is quite natural that uh, you know aristocrats were were not unmindful about the concerns of everyday people a lot of them would go and worship in the same church that they would know they would know the servants and the peasants and you know that they would share some of their concerns and it was you know and you would have um sort of feasts and banquets and you would have high days and 
where you were sort of you were communicating quite closely and um, with your uh, your social inferiors and so you would have quite a degree of knowledge and sympathy i think there's this sort of absurd rewriting that you know sort of that if you've got different classes that things are in, held in place by sort of um oppression by sort of antagonism by you know the the sort of the 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 lord of the manor being extremely haughty and dismissive and uh, having no connection with the people below him and being hated and hating in return, which I don't, which, you know, you can't, you can't get a society to function in that way, uh, at least in a pre-modern period. You know, you it doesn't really work like that. So I think you you do often get sort of uh, liberals uh, turning up amongst the aristocracy and so forth, and you do find sort of. Um, and you, you know, for example, the Fabian movement, you'll find lots of um, upper class people in the Fabian movement. Um, yes, indeed. And um, just a couple of comments in the chat I want to address. So, Namiel uh, Carlson, the inspiration of the character of Gavroche in Les Miserables was this young boy in the painting. Oh, wow, well, that's fascinating. I never knew that. Yeah, uh, that's right. Yeah, so, v Victor Hugo's Les Miserables was um, sort of partly inspired by this painting. Yeah. Um, well, I knew it was um, the, these events, um, but I didn't realize it was this boy, boy in particular. I just never sort of drew the connection there. Um, and also, Lady Shalot, one of the discuss the nightmare by Aunt Henry Fuseli. I have a print of this, and it always draws comment. Uh, no, I've not got that one coming up, sadly. Um, I might have to look that up later. Uh, well, if if, um, if if anyone hasn't seen it, it's of, of a woman who sort of fainted in horror. Who's been struck down by horror, and um, there is a there is a there is a ghostly horse above her, and um, some sort of homunculi, uh, homunculus. Sorry, um, sitting on oh, wait, her I, chest. Oh no, I have seen it. Sorry, yes, the yes, time so, time so, yes. So yeah, so Fusely, um, uh, Fusely was. Um, uh, Swiss artist who spent most of his life in London uh, and was good friends with William Blake and they often shared ideas and Blake said that what he, he often stole his ideas off uh, Fusely. So Fusely was famous for imagery to do with um, horror and drama. He did a whole series of uh, paintings illustrating the works of Shakespeare and there was a big revival in Shakespeare in the Romantic period because um, a lot of um, a lot of his themes of heroism and horror and introspection. So something like you know Hamlet, for example, is considered a, a sort of a proto-romantic um, drama, um, and there was this big fascination with Shakespeare as a proto-romantic uh, dramatist. Um, so yeah, a few of these. Um, terrific artist strange artist and um, i i always used to sort of say well he's he's pretty good but you know like he can't really draw figures it's all based on michelangelo and so forth and these are these would be better if they were more realistic but you know i think actually now that i'm older i think well these images work very effectively be precisely because they're not realistic because they're quite stylized because they're quite stiff uh, and that often to create a forceful image, realism is actually distracting. So you need something that's quite sort of distinct from realism. So it's a bit more artificial and stylized and stiff and awkward in the way that um, Fusely's figures often are. Mm, no, no, certainly. And uh, then we come to the final one of Delacroix. And again, this is one you do bring up in the book. And we alluded to it earlier but this is the Natchez and then um, again this is the uh, as you said the cult of the primitive um and so we've got this um sort of native couple and a newly born baby that sort of just escaped I think some sort of um fight with the uh white man so to speak yeah so this this was uh, in response to the stories of um French not British but French colonizers sort of driving out and exterminating um, Native American tribes, so one of them was the Natchez, um, and I think this, this idea is it's like it's that this is the final pure blood Natchez born, you know, born 
uh, just as his parents are fleeing the French. And this was sort of painted in response and it was sort of obviously, and this was painted in Paris where Delacroix lived. Delacroix never went to America. He's dealing with images and sort of styles um, <clears throat> and, you know, the physiognomy of uh, the figures and so forth are sort of drawn from prints that were circulated in books and so forth. So he never actually went there. He's sort of taking these descriptions from second hand, as it were. And he's using, he's devising this parable of the noble savage, um, as well known. And these are refugees. These are the victims. These are the noble victims of French civilization, of French colonialism. So, you know, he's sort of presenting to the great and the good of France and the common people of France who would be able to see this painting in the salon of the, you know, if they paid their, you know, five centimes or however much it was to get into the salon. And they would see this painting and this would provoke them to think about the value and the cost of the expansion of the French Empire in North America. Uh, well, I mean, like having having said that, I mean, this the, the French aspect, um, the French were no longer actually colonizing at this time. This was uh, North America was actually um, uh, it was either a British in the sense that um, it was uh, Canada or it was um, the USA. I think by this time, the Louisiana purchase had gone through. So I don't think there were any more French well, possessions left, were there? Uh, well, there is one which the French do hold to this day. They hold um, French Guiana in South America. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah, of course. I mean, there's Martinique and stuff and, and, and Saint-Martin and so forth. Yeah, so, I mean, there, there, are, there are a few sort of like... Uh, you know, but this is this is sorry. So actually, this is referring to an earlier stage of the French uh, colonization of uh, North America in the sort of in the province of um, Canada. Yeah. Well, I think it's interesting that you draw this idea of um, romanticizing um, sort of third world refugees uh, and interesting mm. connotations that has with our political situation today uh, amongst a certain political elite. So, yeah, there's there's. Well, I mean, you, you could say, yes, this is a sort of natural outgroup preference of a liberal, but I don't think that Delacroix was a liberal. And maybe what he was celebrating was not was not necessarily saying, oh, well, you should save the Native Americans, but uh, you should be aware of their good qualities. You should be aware of their nobility. You should be aware of their, um, their resourcefulness, their resilience, and so forth, uh, even though it may be doomed. Uh, but, you know, take note of these things. These are good characteristics. These are noble characteristics, even in a people who we ultimately have to defeat and uh, supplant. Mm. And, and I suppose it does go back to the idea of the, the universal brotherhood. You know, we're, we're all humans at the end of the day. Yeah. And, and that was that was a key. That was a key part of romanticism was finding good qualities in uh, primitive peoples, as it were, and saying and, and learning about human nature and saying that these qualities also exist in ours in us but that maybe they have been suppressed maybe they have been forgotten and that is a good thing to remember the basic essential human qualities of courage and dignity and so on and so forth and so what you do is you understand your own people better through having looked at foreign cultures and primitive cultures. I suppose we could say the same with the uh, Orientalist works he did, because um, yeah, it's yeah, almost it, it's like the Orient is a mirror of the West. We learn more about ourselves by contrasting ourselves to a different people. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Okay. So this is... Um, so I've got all five paintings by Thomas. <laughs> I was going to ask, yeah, is it all five? Okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nice yeah, one. I've, okay, great. Yeah, yeah. if we're going to talk about this, it has to be all five. I can't just do one of them. So, yeah, so for those who aren't aware, this is a very famous set of paintings by the British-born American painter Thomas Cole, um, and they're the five stages of empire. And um, 
And if you haven't seen them, well, you're in for a treat because they're a, a wonderful set of paintings. So, uh, so this first one, the Savage States or the Commencement of Empire. So you can sort of see, you know, it's again, you've got the clouds and the mist in the back. You've got the rich green vegetation. Um, you can see the sort of the primitive settlement in the background. And what I also like is um, it's a little bit dark, but you can see there's a hunter to the left. And then if you look in the foreground, you can kind of see a, a deer sort of sprinting away. So there's, and, it, and then in the back, actually, in the middle, you can see there's like another hunting party. So you see lots of, uh, prim again, the, the respect and worship of the primitive and the natural world. Yeah, so Thomas Cole was, I think, was a British-born American painter, so this was painted in America. And the American school of um, Romanticism uh, is centred on the uh, Hudson the Hudson River School. So that's basically artists who are working along the Hudson River Valley in sort of New York, uh, up through sort of New England and so forth. And there was this question about, well... You know, so the um, so for example, the the, the British uh, are, are they are they a northern people? Are they a Celtic people, or are they a Latin people? And it's sort of like you know, when, or or are, or are they a Latin civilization? Are they a sort of like a, a remnant of what the Romans left? So there's this debate about you know, like how much do we take from this and how much do we take from that? And you know, and European civilization, large part of it especially in the south, of course, deriving from the great works of the Romans and the Greeks and their brilliant ruins that inspired us and awe us and which we still struggle to match today. All right. So that was the debate in Europe. But what happens in America? Because you're going to a, to a land that has, it's certainly in most of North America, you've got no stone buildings at all. Not only no Romans, but you've got no buildings. You've got no history. You've got no ruins how do you orientate yourself how do you ground yourself what what are what are the ancient forefathers who you have to emulate because you know you you know literally your uncle was the first white man in this particular territory you know so where are your noble forebears how how are you going to square your nationhood and your national story if you don't have a link to prehistory. The only people who have a link to prehistory are the so-called primitive peoples of the, the, the Indian tribes who largely don't have ruins, they don't have writing, they don't have uh, stone carvings largely. So and and you're in the process of displacing them and get rid and getting rid of them and, and you know trying to civilize them or you know incorporate them into your own um, people or it's certainly into your own sort of society, finding a way of taming them. So what are you going to do? And this theory came up that, well, we don't have the great ruins of the Romans. What we have is the fantastic, noble scenery, raw, untrammeled scenery of the of the of the Western, of the of the plains, of the Rockies, of well, you know, initially, of course, it was um, starting in the east. It was the it was the the grandeur of the Hudson River Valley. So, instead of having the ruins of the ancients, what you had was the nobility. You had the you had the giant trees. You had the this the remarkable mountains, the majestic rivers, and so forth. And so, a lot of the romantic feeling was invested in depicting that landscape because there were no ruins to depict. Uh, and so that's quite interesting and it's worth bearing in mind as we see this series of five paintings develop. Mm, and one other point is note the uh, rock theme on top of the mountain in, in the back because that's a key feature of the series. So the next one we then have the Arcadian or pastoral states. Now things have moved beyond the kind of a hunter-gatherer situation at the first one. So now you can see there is a some sort of a building at, in the back um, Basically, people are sort of leisurely walking around, um, even sort of playing. You can see there's a little boat by the stream between the trees. And um, and also you'll notice that um, with these paintings, um, the perspective um, does shift between them. So it's almost like you're moving around in a kind of circle because now you mm. see the cliff of the rock, which is still present, is now a bit more to the left when it was more central in the, in the previous one. 
Yeah, so so obviously he's depicting an, a sort of uh, an ancient civilization. So he's he's depicting a European. So we should point out he's depicting a a typical progression of a European of a European civilization. Um, or, although you know he's he's taking inspiration from the American landscape. So yeah, th this is the sort of painting that um, an artist like Nicolas Poussin would have painted. Uh, you know, with the sort of the ancient ruins. I mean, this is quite an early stage. So this is a very primitive. Uh, situation but you've got an ancient temple a stone circle or something and then yes you have the sort of the pastoral idyll of um shepherds and goat herds and so forth mm. okay then we get the consummation of empire so things are massively shifted forward and you can see they've got this wonderful visually rich luxurious kind of city state that's now been erected and uh, from the perspective, you can now see the cliff of the rock is now on the, the our very right hand side of the our perspective. And um, though it obviously looks very rich and um, very powerful, uh, there is foreboding because um, it may be a bit hard to see. But if you look in the bottom right hand corner of the painting by the fountain, you may see there are like two boys that are sort of fighting or struggling. Uh, one's wearing uh, green and the other's wearing red. Yeah, so this would. I suppose we would think of this as the as the culmination. This is the high period. This is the period of the sort of the Hellenic period, sort of, of of the greatest art, of the greatest architecture, of the maximum prosperity. I should imagine someone like um, Evola or people who are um, the sort of the, the prophets of doom, as it were, the people who are um, who write about cyclical history would say, you know, that this is already in decline by the time you've. By the time you're no longer a warrior or a first generation farmer you're in decline so this is so this is actually a symbol of decline and, and that fate is about to play itself out because uh, you've already become rotten and soft and decadent um, um and uh, you, maybe they're right well with spengler and uh, one of the focuses of his analysis in decline is the you've got the people of the land the fellaheen and then you've got in contrast you've got the world city the grand bustling metropolis that sort of luxury and decadence and um that's actually something else i wanted to bring out because of romanticism as an art movement it does seem to be um quite world worldly um that's like spengler does mention as well like um you know you've got like these people like byron and shelley who go like um doing these little trips down to italy mm. or they've got you're know, traveling about all over the place and um, wanting to see the various various sites yeah so they they they're deeply in they they so they want to understand yeah they want to understand their own culture but they want to do it through looking at other cultures and of course this just happens to involve some rather nice uh spending some time on some rather nice foreign places and eating you know foreign foods and being quite sophisticated and sort of cosmopolitan dare i say so yeah there's there's, there's yeah i mean there's a lot of sort of nativism that you can find in romanticism but it also involves a degree of um, foreign travel interaction with foreign people uh, admiration for foreign people you know like especially Shelley for example would be someone who admired um you know uh, where he admired the revolution and so forth and and they're sort of they were advocates for foreign sophistication and foreign ideas so yeah so here you have the trading so this is so scene you can hear see here this has come about through foreign trading so there would be foreign textiles there would be foreign wine and foreign art you know the the vases you know some of the some of the plants may have been imported and so forth uh, you can see the ships in the harbor of course they're not they're you know they're traveling far abroad to bring sort of spices and slaves and musicians and works of art and so forth so already you have a sort of a deeply cosmopolitan um, situation where it's already embedded in an international sort of global well not necessarily global but certainly international network of trading and uh, diplomacy and so forth so this is the height of the empire you know this is an empire so this obviously has foreign peoples foreign nations incorporated into it supporting it and that will ultimately cause its downfall i guess mm, they become very weak yeah. which brings us to the next one destruction so uh, yes, yeah, so you see um, a scene not dissimilar to the fall of Rome, 
Um, oh. So, yeah, you see this army coming in, sacking, raping everything, um, you know, complete bedlam. And in fact, um, you mentioned earlier the John Martin paintings about hell. Well, I remember he's got one called Pandemonium. And um, there's like this temple that's wreathed in like darkness in that painting. And it doesn't look too dissimilar to this sort of building complex on the right in this image as well, if you think about it. Yeah, this is the sort of the, the insane colonnade. There's no, there's no, I have to say that in history, there's never been a building that's been as gigantic and as mad as that. Um, but, you know, obviously it's sort of, it's stressing that the empire has become overstretched. It's become too grand. It's become too elaborate to support itself. It's, it, it, it's become weak and it has forgotten its, its founding characteristics, its core characteristics. And that is why it has fallen to, to the barbarians, to the invaders who are sacking the city, who are destroying and killing and, and yeah. And so this is, so this is the, nat the natural end of an empire is the invasion by more vital outsiders who supplant uh, and destroy. And the sculpture on the right is based on something called uh, the Borghese warrior, uh, which was a famous statue from uh, Roman times, uh, which sort of was used as um, an example of the classical mastery of um, anatomy. So it was something that a lot of students would have known. And so, of course, the Borghese warrior associated with Rome, you look at the buildings, of course, look very Roman. So yeah, so this is an, an analogy for the fall of Rome. It also makes me, though it's a very different statue, it also makes me think of um, another famous Hellenic um, sculpture, the, the Winged Victory of Samothrace, which is also, if you mm. see it, it, it's it's a ruin of what it once was. Yeah, yeah, and that, that's got a great sense of forward motion to it. It's, it's, in, it's incredible. Um, so anyone going to the Louvre, I mean, you have to take time to look at that because that's such a, that's so really exciting. I mean, it's, a, it's an absolute wreck, of course, but it's a really exciting piece of sculpture. Mm. And um, yes, and the look up at the back, you, we can now see it starting to move back towards the centre. And then the final one, desolation. So the ruins of the civilization are just all that's left. And as you can see, nature is starting to reclaim. You see the vines and growth for taking over everything once more. And um, you mentioned Shirley earlier, but I, I have to say it, you know, my name is Ozymandias, King of Kings. Look upon my works, ye mighty and despair. Mm. Yeah, so so this is uh, this is also another trope of rom romanticism is the ruin. So um, the idea of man overcoming nature to build something and then nature reclaiming it. So it's a sort of it's a sort of symbol of uh, human hubris, where the great works of man are changed; they are fused with the action of time and nature, and so you end up with these ruins, which uh, are places that will inspire travelers, that will inspire writers, and they will dream about what was wonderful, what was there before, the civilization which erected such great structures how could it have fallen and of course um uh, that that's sort of one of the key points of um romanticism is this sort of admiration and l longing for the past but also a kind of an appetite for destruction a kind of pleasure in ruin a kind of pleasure in knowing that you can't achieve that perfection and actually taking a little bit of pleasure out of the fragments rather than the unity of the completed thing. Mm, almost like a, a fetishization of melancholy. Mm, mm, yeah. Mm. Right. Uh, so now we come to another painting um, you bring up in your book. So this is View of Dresden by yeah, View of Dresden by Moonlight by Johann Christian Dahl. So um, a very haunting painting. This is a view of Dresden, the sort of like night time and um, because Dahl is a, um, a Norwegian painter, and um, something you talk about, which is something we've not really looked at, is that with 
romanticism, especially the German romanticism, the epicenter of that was Dresden um, in uh, Saxony. And because um, I'm... Uh, go on. In that, yeah, go on. Oh, well, yes, yes. Basically, just to say that, you know, um, this was one of the many parts of um, Germany that wasn't really Germany. Uh, that was only incorporated into Germany with unification in 1871, I believe. Yeah, so Dahl was actually friends with Caspar David Friedrich, uh, who we saw at the beginning of the stream, so it ties up nicely. Uh, he was one of his colleagues. He taught in Dresden uh, at the Academy, Academy there, and a lot of painters studied in Dresden, including particularly the Russians. Uh, the Russians didn't have a particularly strong art tradition at the time. So if you were an artist, if you're a Russian artist and you wanted proper professional training, then you would go to an academy, usually in Dresden or possibly Munich. Um, yeah, also Paris as well. Um, and uh, yeah, so Dresden was where Dahl lived and here we have the sort of the, the nocturne, which is uh, a sort of a, a typical a typical subject for romanticism because, of course, the night is connected with dreams to do with irrationality, to do with inactivity because people don't work at night generally. And this is a time for reflection. This is a time for inspiration, uh, for illicit activity, for crimes, for banditry for the visiting of brothels and so forth. So the night time was a time that's a place where you can dream, where you can have nightmares, where you can do unusual things and where the world seems different, um, where things, the natural things are inverted, where the sky is no longer light, but it is dark and so forth. And that's um, one of the key traits of romanticism is sort of looking at things being reversed or changed or transformed or looking at things from a different perspective. Um, so this is, uh, uh, and Dahl was, was particularly famous for his nocturnes. So um, it's well worth taking a look at his stuff. Mm -hmm. Certainly. And um, another point, because this one also reminds me, because you did a stream with Apostolic Majesty on the cultural destruction of Germany during the Second World War. And um, obviously knowing everything about the Romantic movement in Dresden just adds even more tragedy to the, mm. uh, the bombing of Dresden during the war. So, Yeah, so so during the Second World War the, um, in February 1945, Dresden was essentially flattened. It was firebombed um, by the RAF. Uh, it was a sort of uh, and there's sort of debate about you know whether or not this was sort of intended to be as destructive as it turned out to be. Was this an act of was this an, was this a tactical act or was this a symbolic act against to erase uh, you know sort of um, one of the great achievements of um, German civilization, which was the building of Dresden and the collection of artworks there and uh, just the, the city itself. Um, and there was, and, and it's been, has, I, I've, I've visited Dresden a few times when I lived in Germany and it's been rebuilt, but obviously it's, um, it's clearly not, not what it was. Um, they've generally, they've done quite a good job with rebuilding. They've been quite respectful. And this has also been the case in some areas in Berlin and especially in the Potsdam, you know, like the Garrison Kirch, um, which is just reopened in Potsdam, which is just outside Berlin. And you can see that there's been great care and pride lavished on reconstructing these places, but they're not, they're not what was there originally. Uh, and so I think that that's always in the back of your mind when you visit these places. Mm. I, I guess it's sort of um, darkly poetic considering, you know, that Romantic, romanticism's fixation on ruin and destruction. Mm. Oh, yes. Yeah, very, very much, you know, sort of. So, you know, ruin is the destiny of all great cities. And, you know, sometimes that ruin happens slowly and gradually, and sometimes it happens uh, in the course of one night. Mm -mm. Right. Okay. Uh, then here's another one you bring up in the book, uh, The Grindelwald Glacier by Thomas Fernley. 
uh, who I believe is also another Norwegian painter. And um, again, you kind of got a bit of a posture of thing going on because you've got all the like the sheep in the foreground sort of grazing, and then it's like I think there's a shepherd in the background you can just make out, and then you've got this grand, like wonderful um, glacier sort of gliding down the, the mountain. And uh, it's almost like there's a bit of implied danger because uh, if you notice the trees have actually got some damage or tearing to them. So it was implied that there's there's been some sort of like avalanche or or flood or some or some sort of natural um, disaster uh, in the past, but because it's frozen, you're safe. For now. Yeah. So 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 here, um, Norwegian civilization is living right up with the harsh reality of nature, right on the very limits of what is cultivatable. Um, and so yes, yeah, so you have. Um, so sort of sheep farming and sort of um is is the is the typical way that you would use this sort of um this landscape which is not flat and it's very very stony and it's, it's not particularly welcoming you can't you can't till it really um you just sort of harvest the, you harvest the wood and you you graze your sheep on it and so th this is uh, this is something is part of the search for national character and this was particularly important for the Norwegians because of course they were they lived under a series of um, uh, sort of empires and uh, sort of dual kingdoms where they never had where they didn't have autonomy they were ruled over by the Danes or by the Swedes um, and they only gained independence right at the end of the 19th century um, was it the beginning Nin of the 20th century or beginning of the 19th century? 1905 is when... The yes, yeah, 1905, yeah, so it was, right, it was right on the cusp of that, yeah. So, um, yeah, uh, and so uh, Fernley became like a sort of a, one of the national heroes, as it were, of um, Norwegian culture, um, but even though, of course, he didn't live to see independence himself. Well, you know, you, you must venerate the, uh, the great men of the past, otherwise you, you don't have a culture, do you? So... Yeah, and and uh, and naturally the Norwegians were really drawn to this, and of course they were extremely proud of uh, the landscapes, the drama of the landscapes, especially the fjords and the mountains, and the glaciers, which were of course particularly typical for Norway. Norway just is essentially just a, a long strip of coast. It's there's apart apart from the south where there's more inland areas, but it's essentially a, a strip of coast, and so all of all of the towns, all of the civilization, all of the habitable regions, as it were, are right on the coast um, in this particularly rocky and dramatic coast. So this is typical of Norway. And so this was something that people were keen to reproduce because it was something that was unique to Norway, pretty much. I mean, you get some fairly similar paintings of Switzerland, for example, but this is particularly typical of Norway. And so this was a suitable subject for Norwegian national painters. And just to address that very quickly, uh, reaction reading law. Grindelwald oh, yes, that's right. Yes. Grindelwald. Yes. Sir. Yeah. So sorry. Uh, so Fernley, Fernley did lots of paintings of Norwegian landscapes, but this happens to be one of um, uh, a da, 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 of a Swiss uh, glacier. That's well spotted yeah i was actually thinking of uh, other paintings that he'd done yeah um, I, I mean it's close enough i imagine you get something very similar to this in norway so yeah well i mean this, this is this is often what he did was that paintings uh that were almost interchangeable almost interchangeable so if you didn't if you didn't have if you didn't have the label you would be you would mistake this for a norwegian landscape mm, no very powerful piece Right, now we come to a Turner. Uh, so this is the Fighting Temeraire tugged to her last birth to be broken up. So very famous painting by uh, Turner, another English romantic painter. So um, so here um, I've got, uh, got like an interesting contrast between the past and the future. You've got, um, obviously in the 1830s, you've got the, uh, the invention of the steam engine and you've got these uh, modern like industrial ships and you've got this modern ship pulling this old sort of ship of the um of the line um sailing ship and um you know again it, you've got this idea of melancholy because you know she's going to be broken up so this um good old um battleship because obviously the british are very pr 
proud of their naval heritage. So um a bit sad to see this um this ship going to be destroyed. So yeah, and um so what you've got is you've got a steamship here with this is a paddle wheel steamer pulling the old um the old battleship, the old warship um to be destroyed, to be broken up. Um but this is this is the way it was because um you know military technology had moved on very rapidly and britain was at the forefront of that so britain was at the forefront of the steam engine and the paddle wheel and the ironclad later on and you know and the sort of the uh you know the, the explosive shell as opposed to the cannonball and so britain was you know it was the leading naval power at the time so making those advances meant that there was a natural redundancy of older ships which had noble histories which had been technologically advanced for their own time but were due to be replaced you couldn't fight a modern uh, modern war with old warships uh, so uh, there was not much of a culture of preservation um at the time so this is some um, sad fact of life that um yes the old must give way to the new and there was a degree of melancholy about it mm, well at least they uh they kept the victory around for obvious reasons so yeah so the the victory is one of the few exceptions also something like the cutty sark well the cutty sark wasn't a warship but uh yeah the victory of course is particularly it had a particularly important link because of nelson but uh yeah but generally of almost almost all of the um I mean, yes all of the other ships were uh, broken up um also i think in america they've got the uss constitution um which was a ship from the revolutionary war they still keep that around and i think it's actually still uh, technically part of the american fleet so, so I don't think yeah they throw it into action and, again. and they also have uh, um, i mean they they've also got some uh, things like uh, some ironclads they've got the sort of the um essentially what was submarines the first generation of submarines that fought in the civil war uh and these these were ones that they had to they they weren't really seaworthy and they had to be rescued and uh, refloated um uh you know many many years afterwards so they were sort of um they were lifted from the seabed but uh, yeah m most of um <coughs> most of these older ships of course were uh broken up yeah. mm -hmm. right Okay, uh, so this is um, from quite an obscure artist I've never actually heard of before, but this is um, Piotr Michalowski. So he's a Polish painter. And um, so this is called writer. So writer is the German word for cavalryman. So it literally means rider. And um, I think that what this is um, going back to is in the 16th and 17th centuries, you would have um, in a lot of German, you had these German mercenary soldiers called the Schwarzreiters or the Black Riders, which would. Um, go out and do a lot of the fighting um sort of come up a lot in the 30 years war and um obviously i think you've got very dashing obviously if you look at the uh the hat and the uh the movement of the horse so you know sort of very chivalric i think yeah and um this is particularly interesting because the poles were a people without a nation or a sort of a nation without a state as it were um, because um, Poland was carved up at different times by the Russians and the Prussians and um, the, the Austro-Hungarians, the Austrians. So a, lo a lot of their, their land, so, you know, whole generations of them lived through periods where they were a definite people, but they were just simply part of the Austrian Empire or the Prussian Empire or the Russian Empire. So romanticism became in one route for imagining a glorious past and agitating for national independence. Um, this is, and this is um, so this is a, a typical painting, a Polish painting, which sort of celebrates martial valor and energy and so forth, even though, of course, yes, you're right. So this this may actually be a German mercenary rather than a Pole. But there was a lot of paintings of uh, Polish soldiers. Mm, indeed. And um, what's also important is obviously it's a cavalryman. Obviously, Poland has a very proud um, cavalry military tradition, especially with the uh, the winged tussars at the uh, the Battle of Vienna, saving the city from the Turks. So, 
Yeah, and and there was um, the, the Battle of Grunwald was some um, is sort of celebrated as a, oh yes a, a, the, the the great alliance between the the kingdoms of Lithuania and Poland when they sort of um, fought to, to defeat I think it was the Prussians. Um, I, I, I can't. Well, it was the Teutonic Order, but yeah, the Teuton the Teutonic Order. That's right. Yeah. Uh, yeah so th there's there's a lot of romantic art that. Um, deals with battles, uh, not not just in Polish uh, romantic art, but you know, sort of in all subjects. Uh, that obviously the battle is uh, particularly fitting for art that has a national character or a national message. It's um it's sort of perfect for the act of heroism for the great individual, for the great man, for portraying the great man in action, leading a decisive moment in history. Um, of course. Napoleon, of course, is a very big figure uh, when you look at these paintings of the Romantic period because uh, Napoleon was considered sort of a, a typical product of Romanticism in that he was a, a great man from a humble uh, background who became great through the force of will. Um, so, you know, not, not an Enlightenment figure, not a, an Apollonian figure, but um, a Dionysian figure. No, absolutely. Uh, right. Okay, and this is the final painting uh, for this evening. Uh, so a, a little bit after the Romantic period, this is 1860, this is Twilight in the Wilderness by an American painter called Frederick Edwin Church. And um, yeah, this this painting is has a really strong wow factor because I love the mm. um, the contrast. You've got the, the haunting, moody forest and the, uh, the blood red sky. Um, so... And um, yeah, people might. Uh, yeah, so, so this, this, sorry, the, the, so this is a, a typical example of the Hudson Bay School. So great choice, nice one to end on. So this is, you know, as I said, um, celebrating the the grandeur of nature, um, as a sort of as a conduit to self knowledge, to as a as a way of understanding the cosmos. Um, because the Romantics were largely you that they're sort of pagan in outlook, so they they're not they're not saying that you will gain understanding of yourself and your place in the world through um, through communion with Christ or with God administered by the Church, but rather you will receive self knowledge and understanding of your place in the universe through contemplation of nature so um and yeah and so here we have the sort of the ruinless primitive raw um landscape of north america uh, as seen in the 1860s so the 1860s are yeah that's essentially that's called the post-romantic period so this is after the high period of sort of, I think, you know, maybe the romantic period sort of cuts off at about sort of 1840s, as it were, 1850, maybe. And everything, and it sort of trails on, you get romantic painters working in the end of the 19th century. But eventually it sort of, it, it, it turns into different forms, into different art movements, into specific ones. So you've got like symbolism, and you have decadent art, and you have... Uh, found a siècle and you get um, uh, Art Nouveau and so, stuff, which is sort of develops from Romantic art, but is something quite distinctive. No, and um, I have to say, um, there's something I think profoundly American about this piece of art, because um, I brought Spengler up a few times during our discussion, but I'm going to make one final point with Spengler. Uh, so the other week, um, I don't know if you've heard of this gentleman, uh, Alexander, but there's a... Uh, an account on Twitter called Spurger Acolyte, and he's a bit of a Spengler expert. He often tweets a lot. And um, he shared a painting by Caspar David Friedrich the other week, which is called, um, I think it's just called um, the, the Arbenz, and it's just it, literally the evening in English, and it's just them um, mm. two figures in, like, a forest at twilight. Oh, yes, and, and then um, you see them from behind. Yes, yes, I know, yeah. yeah yes, and um, very similar, I think, to this one in the way mm. with the mood. And um, Spurger was saying that, this paint, the image in this painting is what Spengler wanted you to think of in the West because the cry of the West by Spengler, the original German title is the Untergang des Arbeitslanders, 
which literally translated is the twilight of the evening lands. And mm. when you look at this painting, that it, it screams the twilight of the evening lands because it's the time of day. But also, if you think about it, America's the most Western of Western country and Western civilization. So it's mm. literally the twilight of the evening lands. So yeah so i mean apart apart from the the american west which was obviously which had been conquered by the 1860s this, this was about as far west as you, as civilization as western civilization as european civilization could go so yes you're you're right on the limits you're on the limits of civilization and you're on the limits of the day and fittingly we're on the limits of our podcast of our discussion mm, indeed mm. Well, thank you very much, um, Alexander. So before we wrap up, um, if anybody wants to ask us any questions, um, please feel free, free to ask them while you still have us. Yeah, and thanks to everyone in the chat for such a sort of interesting and diverse comments and, and people picking up on things that we hadn't, uh, we hadn't noticed. Uh, yeah. Okay, and um, so while we're sort of waiting to see if there's any questions, is there anything you would like to show? Uh, yes, um, so uh, my Substack is alexanderadamsart.substack.com. Also, uh, if you're interested in the book Blood, Soil, Paint, which we've been referring to, that's available through Imperium Press. So that's imperiumpress.org. And that is where you can find my lino cuts. So these are limited edition artist prints. So if you'll see my avatar, that is a Lovecraft. If you fancy getting yourself one of the 60 copies of this print, signed and numbered by me, go to imperiumpress.org and pick up a copy while you still can, because once it gets sold, there will be no more reprints. So uh, get in quickly and um, get yourself uh, something else. Oh, there's also lots of other um, writers as well. So I've got uh, Knut Hamsen, we've got um, Denuncio, um, Carlisle has sold out, but you can still get Evola. So um, nip in and get those before they sell out. We've got a couple that are getting close to selling out. Mm, no, the, the, I've seen those. They're absolutely wonderful work you've done there. And um, I have put the links to your Substack and Twitter below in the description of the stream. Yeah, thanks very much. So that's going. That's on the merchandise page on uh, Imperium Press. Uh, and it's, it's been uh, terrific to work with uh, Mike over at Imperium. He's been very supportive of my writing and my art. Um, so, and, and you know, uh, people have been very supportive in general. So uh, uh, thank you to everyone who's bought a book or bought a print. It really does make a difference to me. And, um, and, uh, uh, and um, you know, yeah. And, and, you know, people should support Imperium Press because they are a fantastic, wonderful publisher because um, you're probably aware, Alexander, but there was a hit piece against them in The Guardian, um, which um, Mike actually responded to. So unfortunately, they are coming increasingly under attack by the powers that be. So, yes. Yeah, so, um, uh, yeah, that, that's, that is the case. So um, if you want to show your support for um, older perennial thinking, uh, for older, older um, authors, who were writing about things that um, are true, but are politically um, awkward, you know, talk, talking about, you know, human nature and um, the way societies tend to organize themselves, then yeah, absolutely. Go over to Imperium Press and um, buy a book or two and buy a print or two. Mm -hmm. And um, in terms of this channel, uh, so, Tomorrow night, um, please join me um, for the return of Marcus Furious Pertinax because we will be finishing uh, a stream we started several months ago. We will be doing part two of the My Reminences of East Africa uh, discussion on the adventures and campaign of uh, Paul von Etter Vorbeck in East Africa. Uh, so join us for that. That will be about 10 o'clock tomorrow night. Uh, in addition, next Saturday, uh, same time as this evening at 9 p.m., I'll be joined once again by my friend Hunger because we will be going, we're doing a bit of a series um, actually on this channel. We're going to be looking at doing several streams on the book, the Chatham House version by uh, Eli Kaduri. Um, so essentially it's a series of essays on the uh, political uh, politics and history of the modern Middle East. So if you're interested, um, 
check that, that out. So oh, thank you everybody for watching and uh, good night. Good night. <laughs>